Hello, students. Um, this is the uh, last class video uh, recording, and uh, I need to uh, admit to you uh, it has been an experiment because uh, back when I was uh, anchoring the show for Beijing TV or uh, doing the on camera uh, presenting uh, in our uh, documentary uh, production. Uh, series. Uh, I never uh, use like a, so many hand gestures because in the post production, if you have too many uh, hand gestures, you may end up, you know, finding it very difficult to cut uh, for the good sequence uh, effect. And then the other thing I never did before it, uh, was like things like you scratch your head or uh, you know. Uh, touching your nose or your face those were not considered professional or even socially uh, acceptable as the uh, etiquette you know uh, protocol the reason i did all that in the last six uh, class video recording was uh, i was trying to make it less boring because uh, watching class video uh, i'm gonna admit it's never fun right so i was trying to make it more lively you know uh, because you do that at home uh, but the thing is you're not supposed to do it in the public so if um you had a problem or you didn't feel comfortable about that apologize for that and if you want to drop some comments on that that's okay uh actually that's more than welcome because after all that was uh part of it i want to say uh experiment to see uh if people feel uncomfortable uh, about it so anyway uh let's uh, proceed to the uh core content itself um we talked about the uh operating research well precisely we didn't talk about it i mentioned in the previous uh classes uh that was basically the purpose of uh my coming into this program uh the uh, supply chain management and the technology program at the uh, College of Technology in University of Houston. I came in uh, initially to work with uh, a particular uh, professor whose uh, specialty was uh, in mathematics. And I worked with this professor about five years ago, uh, back while I was on a project uh, for uh, rather big uh, oil company uh, was the HQ located right here in Houston, United States. Um, so why did I um, need to uh, work with a uh, professor in a, in a university, in this case, particular in the University of Houston? The reason for that was um, I ran into a problem uh, which obviously the uh, mathematic model analysis would typically do some good and uh, at a, a, I guess a oil, gas and chemical company of certain scale, uh, math model analysis to, you know, use uh, to uh, solve problem. It's a very common uh, approach, uh, except for in this case, in the uh, upstream sector of the uh, oil, gas, and uh, chemical company. It is rarely done. Um, so it had lots of reasons. One of the reasons is within the uh, upstream sector, I'm just going to say it, okay, the way it is. The supply chain management uh, people uh, in this sector, actually, a lot of them may or may not even have a bachelor degree okay even if they did it may not be directly related uh, to the line of trade they're in today and um, so um, i guess that could explain partially at least why the math model analysis as a you know good approach never really used in the upstream sector uh the project uh inbound material logistic management, right? This is a subject, I wrote a book uh, at about uh, 200,000 words, 
commissioned by a uh, publishing house uh, in London. So I obviously have a lot to uh, talk about on this subject. And uh, after I came back from a project, which I cannot disclose here in public, I felt so strong about it. And so I talked to my clients and they apparently could not uh, find a way to fund such a um, model analysis uh, approach, which basically um, you, you could uh, develop something and um, be used in many projects. And all the oil company, they all have uh, multiple projects going at the same time. So in a way, um, the problem with my clients was really an uh, internal problem because how do you find something like this? Do you do it at the corporate level? The way the finance is structured, uh, it would not lend a uh, automatic, uh, I guess, avenue for that. But if you want to do it at the uh, project level, the project typically, uh, they don't want to spend the money, they don't have to. Um, do they all recognize the uh, necessity for such a math model uh, analysis or uh, quantitative uh, analysis uh, approach? Absolutely, everybody um, agree. So where do you get the money? So uh, with that, uh, I went internally into the same oil company where I was uh, working uh, on this uh, project. I went to their internal uh, unit where only one uh, guy was there, uh, got a PhD in this thing, and uh, obviously he's got it. Uh, he was, let's put it this way, he, he was inundated by a lot of uh, requests to do the modeling. So when I talked to him over the phone, he was excited. He liked this kind of uh, uh, problem solving situations. And uh, he was generally interested. However, he did t tell me that uh, I would have to get on the uh, waiting list. And the queue basically already extended to 18 months later, which is way beyond my contract, you know, at that company. You know, you know, I, I want to solve the problem or at least give it a shot before I, you know, I guess uh, eventually left that uh, project or that company. So um, I did ask, uh, even for the internal uh, projects, uh, what was the rate? Uh, well, I cannot disclose the uh, exact number. I don't want to get a lawsuit here, but um, it is... Uh, not uh, inexpensive, let's put it this way, right? Um, so there I was. I was thinking, you know, would it make some sense to work with the uh, academic or, uh, you know, education institutions? It, it might, because they do have the uh, talents, uh, you know, basically in math. And, and of course, in this country, uh, which is USA, that's what I'm talking about, and that's where I am. Um, there are many, many uh, good education uh, institutions that are specialized in the uh, operation research, specifically for supply chain management, specifically for logistics. Um, but the thing is, nobody actually has the hands-on experience working on upstream sector of oil, gas, and the chemical industry specifically for the project inbound material logistic operation management problems. Um, for this subject, I actually had previous uh, contact initially uh, with uh, some of the, uh, I guess, most famous education institutions in China. I, I'll be honest with you, I had the uh, perception or misperception about it could be cheap to uh, go there. Um, at one of these uh, inst top institutions in China, uh, where all the professors were from the United States, uh, I'm talking about the training, okay? Uh, they got their PhDs from the U.S. Uh, institutions. And the first department chair, and this is the uh, industrial engineering department, was actually from North Carolina, uh, the university there. So I had a couple of 
conversations, uh, I made an appointment in that, and so I, I, I went to uh, see the chair back there. Uh, that was the second chair, uh, following the first one, uh, white American, uh, retired from that uh, position, and, you know, the first Chinese uh, chair. So everything was good, except for I realized they did not have the relevant hands-on project experience. And he, he, I guess you could imagine, it takes some time to actually get the uh, academic folks to actually understand what is the problem, you know, scope it and scale it, you know. But they, they would need to go through a process where the IT folks are referring to as the bridging, okay? So the business application requirements and in that case, the IT uh, terminologies and way of thinking and the logics and, and basically a translation. So I would presume it's typically about the same, but then uh, my host of the conversations at the on campus at the uh, Chinese uh, education institutions, they uh, assured me it shouldn't take a long time because those people, um, the OR, Operation Research uh, Experts, it took them almost no time to understand what the problem is. And of course, you know, they're a big the difference. Because uh, let's face it, okay, um, in the uh, what people call business, uh, uh, business logistics, which basically just to differentiate from the military logistics, Operation Research has not been uh, deployed as a good means to solve problems as much as it should be. So why? So far, and this is not to criticize any particular education institutions, famous or not famous, established or not established. It's basically the same, okay? Across the uh, whole globe, I would say. Um, the academic people typically, well, not that I am one of them, <laughs> except for uh, I am, I would say I am more a business person rather than an academic. Uh, just because I'm teaching doesn't mean it changes my uh, perspective, my angle. But anyway, I typically find the uh, academic people, they, can't, they uh, really tend to do uh, their academic paper research, which is really good, you know, um, because in any country, any society, the base science is the solid foundation for technology uh, evolution because you don't have an advanced, uh, you know, solid uh, foundation of really, really uh, advanced basic science. Your technology will not go, you know, too far because, hey, that's the foundation, right? Having said that, uh, if you're in the business of supply chain management and you're in the uh, specialty of uh, operation research dedicated to supply chain management, uh, my argument is that is not something like a pure math. You can just, you know, close the door in, in, a, in a closed circuit or circle to um, basically focus just on your pure theory. You cannot cut off you know, your ties, your connection with the business uh, application requirement. So you need to develop a really comprehensive, uh, co you know, understanding of the situations in those uh, problems before you walk in and offer your solutions. So the problem was a lot of, uh, uh, even the famous uh, professors, they walk into the business situations, right? But with what? The solutions and they try to have the uh, business uh, real problem fitting into their solution formulations and that's where I personally become annoyed and and I believe that's why um, you would uh, find uh, the OR uh, PhD professor meaning you know they they're the students they're training are the uh, PhD degree pursuing, right? So 
when they walk into a real situation in the business in the industries, um, basically they're trying to teach uh, the business people what is optimization, which is fine. But then also try to tell them what is objective. You know, why do you need it? And uh, that is problematic by itself. And and I will explain why in in the real situation scenario that I'm going to give you one. Uh, of course, you know this is uh, the case scenario here is case in point, right? Um, I will not mention any uh, company name, but this is the very very similar case scenario. Nobody could tell which company this was from because I I've, I've been on many many uh, projects and certain things basically they're so similar you can't even tell uh, which company this is attached to. I do know where the com oil companies differ in uh, business practice, but I'll be very careful not to uh, reveal that in this uh, real case. So uh, let's get to that real case. Yeah, um, I was on a uh, project, which is, and we, we talked about this before, right? Uh, let's define this first. Uh, it is not all upstream per se, technically. But it is with, you know, basically eventually falling into the uh, work scope of typically upstream folks uh, such as myself. Uh, so why did I say that? Let, let, let me uh, explain a little bit. Um, you have the development, which is definitely upstream. Um, development, mean, you know, referring to just imagine like a real estate, uh, you would have a real estate developer, right? You have guys going out there, uh, find uh, the allocated place and start construction, right? So that's very similar to development uh, of the upstream. Um, and of course, you know, we deal with the um, infrastructure too. Um, so that's what people call green side, meaning there is no outstanding infrastructure around that uh, or on or around or about the uh, construction site or the job site. So that's green side. And then um, we also would uh, work on the brown side. What is brown side? Brown side is the outstanding structures there. You probably need to do some improvement and upgrading, but basically you work on the outstanding uh, place with the outstanding uh, infrastructure, and that is referred to as brown side. What is brown side project for the folks like myself in the upstream uh, sector? Well, redevelopment. Redevelopment, basically, you're uh, upgrading the production operation capacity, uh, elevating to the next level, and that is redevelopment, right? And then you have uh, uh, expansion, okay? So expansion basically works about the same, uh, except for like a refinery or uh, chemical plants, you know, uh, you do that. Uh, Let's say the original uh, production capacity was designed for oh, how many barrels per day, and uh, that that's of course uh, the uh, process in the crude oil and turn them into um, either meat or downstream products or both. Um, so you um, raise the uh, daily production capacity, right? And then you have turnaround. What is turnaround? Um, turnaround is a, uh, well, any chemical process plants. Uh, I used to, actually, my first job was a, which I mentioned was a uh, chemical uh, inspector for uh, a uh, quality control department of a pharmaceutical factory. So the uh, pharmaceutical plant I worked at looked very similar. It's not exactly the same, but very similar to a chemical plant, right? Um, so basically, you can't stop it because once you stop, a lot of uh, equipment get wasted. You can't just uh, randomly uh, stop the process, the operation. What you do, you do your maintenance and the repair in a scheduled, uh, uh, I, I, I guess, task. So you're prepared to stop. And once you do stop, you start all this um, you know, maintenance and, and repair repair and this is also a good opportunity for you to uh, you know add a few more whatever things into the process and that's typically a turnaround 
Okay, um, so obviously, now, the turnaround is not going to be at the same uh, monetary scale comparing to the development, redevelopment, or expansion, right? So one of the expansion projects I worked on, before I joined them, it was supposed to be $5 billion. And uh, when I was there, it evolved into $6 billion. And then after I left, it arrived at $7 billion before it, uh, the uh, project was completed. So uh, that was an expansion there for you. And that was a chemical uh, plant, uh, which is good business compared to the uh, oil business. So anyway, um, back to the point, uh, I was on a project which is redevelopment of an oil field in Europe. So I flew to there and um, our colleagues there uh, in that uh, particular country in Europe, uh, they were prepared for me uh, because my client told them, we're going to send you the best. Oof, that was a comfort zone for me to get into, right? So I uh, landed in that country and then I went to that company and I uh, joined the meeting. And that was supposedly uh, for logistic only. And this is a company uh, branch in that particular European country. They, um, in the last 30 some years, they never had uh, anything like a redevelopment or development, right? So they did not have, and these are the midstream folks, right? So they never had any upstream development experience or redevelopment experience. That's why I was there for the logistics uh, things. But the meeting took three days, right? And I was sitting there looking back and forth at everybody because he was conducting a language foreign to me. Of course, I was a foreigner there, right? And I'm like, why am I even here? So you have to be polite, right? Your local host. Um, and they were, they were polite, except for when it comes to the actual work, it's like I wasn't even there. Um, so I waited for my turn and I did this raw survey as a, you know, basically you're a logistician, this is what you need to do. So I joined them on a, on, on a raw survey, which I requested and they uh, gave me that opportunity. So we um, basically arrived at that oil field and w which is basically the subject of redevelopment. So basically I uh, surveyed the uh, public highway and then between the public highway and the uh, shared uh, community path connecting between the public highway and the central side. Let's just use this word as central side, okay? Uh, for um, planning purpose. What it is, that's where basically the uh, key capital equipment would be installed. They already have some old ones, this is redevelopment. So they are uh, upgrading, they're adding some new ones and replacing some old ones. Um, and then I hope you get the picture of this thing. Um, from the central side, there was a private path connecting the central side to the oil field, the ultimate uh, place uh, of production. So what did I find on that survey, you know, the route survey uh, or survey route? I find the problems as following. One, if, which this if happens all the time, if that private path uh, becomes the bottleneck of the delivery traffic, of the redevelopment uh, needed equipments, uh, basically uh, bigger equipments, um, it will basically mount, start to mount the pressure to the central side. Because central side, at, on any um, project construction side, uh, to development, redevelopment, uh, expansion, turnaround, any of those, you constantly feel the crunch there. The space is never enough, right? So basically you have the struggle between the staging space allocation and 
the delivery traffic, you know, on site, and then, um, so when you have the traffic, you know, basically on this private pass, uh, connecting and then going into the oil field, you will have the problem because it basically that effect becomes dominant, you know, domino effect, pushing back to the centrals. And then the central, once the uh, trucks line up and get stuck there, then the staging space become, you know, even crunchier, right? So the first bottleneck basically begin to cause more bottlenecks, you know, go the way, go, you know, going all the way back to even outside the construction construction site and start to impact on the uh, traffic of the shared community, you know, pass or road. And uh, in this case, the next door was a chemical plant and they do have the daily uh, traffic pattern, which I basically uh, recorded, you know, different hour of a day, how many trucks they, they, they had to uh, deliver too. And the people going in and out working in the next door chemical plant. And remember, this is not just the two places, the oil field and chemical uh, plant. They have other uh, entities or enterprises, you know, on that uh, shared community road. So when your um, traffic jam start to uh, impact on the uh, shared community road, you will hear about the complaint from your neighbor, but it doesn't just stop there. And then you have this uh, traffic jam extending into the public highway portion. And there you're going to have problems with the local government agency because, uh, 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 that's illegal. So there, when you look at the bottlenecks and then the compounded, uh, snow effect start to growing really fast. And that's a really, uh, very typical scenario in about just every and any construction site in this sector, right? So what would make sense first? Well, it strikes me as a uh, operation research model. Well, actually, uh, actually it's not just a one model because the problems are multiple. Okay. A little bit complicated, let's say. So uh, I came back uh, to Houston and talked to my client. And then my client said, yeah, it does make sense, but where would we find the money to fund your uh, little operation research thing? And that's when it happened, when I started con you know, contacting the uh, professor in University of Houston uh, of this very department you guys registered and enrolled uh, doing this uh, course today, right? Um, so I had the one master degree uh, candidate and one PhD degree candidate led by this professor. And we gave it a shot for about two or three weeks uh, before I finally uh, excused myself because basically we were not communicating effectively because um, I don't think they uh, comprehend the problem. Uh, it, they were struggling, I, I could tell. And this is not anything else, but basically because of lack of uh, project experience to begin with, and then the relevant project experience. Uh, so that made me, I guess, realize that um, this is why the folks lining up to uh, get their uh, job done by the uh, internal expert the lone wolf, wolf, you know, basically worked by himself. For some reason, uh, you know, the salaries, uh, when the market was good, or at least better than now, uh, oil company pay pretty okay, uh, but they want to save on this. So there's one guy <laughs> all by himself. Anyway, um, so let's go further. Um, so now, uh, you know what I, knew a little bit already and let, let's go further so imagine this uh oil field is a uh let's say a a, a a fruit tree 
uh, field, let's say you have a bunch of uh, apple trees, orange trees, whatever, you know, you're running a uh, nursery, okay, plant a nursery, and the uh, particular I items are some kind of fruit trees, I don't care, uh, apple, orange, whatever. So what you would you see, you will see in this uh, particular, you know, field, you will have uh, trees planted in lines, you know, and then if you imagine horizontally, you see uh, all the, tr the fruit trees line up, and then vertically, you basically uh, count them. So in this case, you would have, let's say, uh, 13 lines, okay? So on each line, you would have, uh, let's say, uh, somewhere a dozen or more, all the way between basically one and two dozen trees on each line, and you have 13 lines. And uh, in this case, uh, the oil field, each one of those trees, you know, will be substituted by an oil well. And for many good reasons, when they do the redevelopment in in the uh, in a you know new oil field or old oil field, but basically reserved for this redevelopment, they don't necessarily do every oil well on every line. They pretty much reserve certain, uh, and they have their own technical uh, uh, criteria to decide which to uh, leave it in the reserve, which to be redeveloped today or uh, at least uh, on this project. So what you end up with is a map, okay? This map will tell you uh, on which oil well uh, on a particular line, uh, there was a German word for it, but, uh, I don't remember, but uh, basically uh, it's just a pass, a, you know, basically help you to uh, con commuting uh, on the, those uh, oil field. Um, so in in this case was um, was my um or my to work on um so let's say it's uh you know it's so marked uh, number of oil wells on each line and you have thirteen lines so you you, you got a basic matrix already right you got the horizontal you got a vertical you so you got uh, x you know uh, and y it's pretty clear right. So the first problem is the linear problem because if on this lines uh, you want to get to the uh, let's say line A and um, the oil well um, if we not uh, use letter to uh, put them in a sequence uh, we use number on the line so on the uh, did I get it wrong yeah well actually use the letter on the lines in sequence and use the number on the oil wells, right? So let's say uh, on line B, um, on line B, the oil well number six had somewhat a problem, either or not a problem, but people are working there. So the working party has a whole bunch of tools and materials and equipment. So pretty much just, you know, jam the place and um, you can't really access to the next one beyond the number six. And uh, so what do you do, right? Uh, you have to wait on line B. So, but hey, they're all together 13. So why do you have to work on the line B at this particular point when people are working on the line B's number six? So move to any other random, right? Or how? So basically that's the linear problem, right? When you have the one that is a becoming a bottleneck, you can't get access to the next. Um, so where do you go? That's one problem. And uh, then the other problem is um, from the central side going into the oil field, um, they do have two options at the same time. The first option is the uh, rail, teeny tiny uh, mini uh, little rail system. The locomotive, is uh, actually the size, probably half of your car. And the real cars are like little wagons. Uh, he, he used to entertain 
on your children. Oh, of course, that's a little bit of uh, exaggeration there, but um, pretty much, I mean, it's not uh, the regular freight train, you know, that um, you would imagine. Um, so anyway, um, that's one system. So when you have a system like that, think about it, logistically, when you have certain things, uh, and we're talking about redevelopment, when you have certain things that the lens actually exceeds, exceed the um, dimension, the physical dimension of the, uh, I guess, the, the real cars, your passage clearance becomes a concern. Why? Because, uh, of course, you know, the real track never turn at a sharp 90 degree angle, but it could be a really steep, you know, uh, turn. And with that kind of, you know, over dimension equipment, uh, you can't actually turn on this little rail track. That's the one problem. And then you're like, okay, fine. Uh, for that kind of over dimensional equipment, I don't typically deploy the rail, you know, uh, traffic, but let's, you know, use the uh, little private path uh, road surface. But then you're looking at the different problem, which is weight distribution. You can't just put any heavy stuff going over, right? Why not? Because the uh, road surface uh, original by design, they were only up to certain, you know, basically weight uh, per square inch. And when you have the things that is, you know, above and beyond this uh, weight bearing uh, capacity requirement, the road simply won't last, won't basically let you do that job. So my question to this company uh, or the office, the, the oil field is a local office of, uh, of the branch in that country uh, with HQ in Houston. So I asked them, uh, what is the original design for the uh, weight distribution of this road service on this little private path? I didn't get any answer. And then I was like, okay, fine. Uh, what about what was the last time and when, meaning how long ago, what was the last time the heaviest weight, you know, was transported over this road surface? No answer. Okay. So basically there is no operational data that I need to do my initial calculation manually. Okay. But so that's another problem, right? With all this problem, what does that mean? That represents the risk. What if the heavy lift, you know, we call it heavy haul, coming through and get stuck in this, uh, you know, little pri private pass because the road service uh, basically is not at the uh, level where it should be. Um, and just basically tell you, hey, I'm going to quit when you uh, work me over uh, that irresponsibly. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that's the, uh, the risk there, right? And when all this happened, oh, one more problem still within this realm, this section of the traffic, they had only one real car and real locomotive series, basically one little locomotive dragging two or three, two, I think, two real cars, mini real cars. And I asked about the, you know, basically, how long does it take to for this little real uh, let's call it the uh, locomotive and, and uh, real car, you know, sequence. How do they make a run? Uh, how long does it take? And they gave me the time. I'm not going to disclose. It's very, very slow. And then you imagine the truck speed coming off from the public highway and coming through that shared community road into the central side, this two speed are not matched. So what does that represent? That represent the definite, definite bottleneck on this side, you know, uh, after the central uh, side. And then the uh, trucks, before they get into the central side, they, they will be joining in a very long queue and on the growth 
by the hour. So how do we solve this problem? Uh, you know, obviously the easiest thing is to, hey, double, triple, or, uh, you know, quadruple, whatever, the capacity on this side, you know, to um, raise the, um, I guess the capacity or capability of the uh, local transport between the central side and the oil field. But here we go. Let's say you could approve the budget. It was really cheap for a uh, oil company redevelopment project, 100,000 euro. Is that a lot of money to buy a locomotive? I don't think it is. Uh, but the track, the real track, it can only accommodate one at a time, right? Because uh, you put too many, uh, they're going to bump into each other. Uh, I, I, I would see the scheduling problem there. So you need to add more real track. And do you have the real estate property to actually accommodate that? That's another problem, right? So we got a problem, problem, and problems. Uh, hey, what's, what's a logistician? That's your job to solve the problem. In our daily life, we have problems, right? Uh, you have a problem with your pet because your pet did not really do exactly what you uh, hope the pet is doing. But the pet is still just simply being a pet. If the pet is not behaving the way you expect, that's only your problem because you didn't train the pet really well, right? You, you can only be uh, upset, uh, you know, because you failed the training. And here's the same thing. I was sent in to do my job as a logistician and I identified the problems. And, uh, what about the solution, right? Um, if you cannot convince the local folks there, uh, they speak the language you don't, which becomes a uh, challenge, obviously. You have to communicate to them. Okay, so um, some of them do speak English and they pretend they don't conveniently, uh, but eventually I got my message through and they're like, you don't think we thought about that? We don't have the budget for it. That's why I came back to my uh, uh, clients in the United States and talked to them about this. And uh, of course, they don't have the budget for it. And that's not their fault either. It's really the uh, corporate management, their vision, their strategy. So here we are. We know the solution needed, but there's a bigger picture that you're not in it. Um, so let's go back to the scenario. Um, and so we talk about the uh, oil field, you know, basically delivery traffic there and the problem uh, is not matching in scale, uh, the in pace with the uh, central side um, delivery traffic. So here we um, start to uh, examine even more problems. Okay, like I said earlier, the Staging space allocation on the construction side is always a problematic by itself. Why? First, we never have enough space for staging. Un un that is called on-site staging. We don't. Okay. And when you have the traffic built up with all these uh, bottlenecks, you start to feel the need to allocate more staging space and which is not available on site. So now you need offside staging space, which would create additional traffic to deliver them to the offside and transport back and forth. That just added more complication to the already complicated delivery on site traffic, right? So what does that do to the queue lining up outside the gate of the construction site? You can imagine that. And um, with this uh, staging, and imagine the offload of heavy lift, you would have the gang and, and gear basically waiting on side. And they take up, you know, they take up a lot of uh, uh, spaces around the uh, staging space or lay down space designated because they have to have the work uh, space to work around the thing while it's being unloaded, you know, lay down. Um, so, they are there waiting for the trucks to come through the uh, gate and the truck is, has been sitting there and got stuck, right? So on this side, the, the gang, the gear, they're ticking the clock of demurrage. And then on the other side of the gate, the trucks are doing the same thing. 
And um, then at the oil field, the working team waiting to install, they could not see that thing coming. So we got a three parties on demurrage because of the traffic. So what do you think now with all this problem mounting and we're not even done yet. We're not even halfway through. There are a lot more problems that um, I guess um, I cannot describe right now uh, because of the time, uh, because we are what, uh, 46 uh, minutes into the hour already. So with this problems and problems and problems compounded all together at the same time, uh, what we're looking at, we're looking at the operational revenue loss, okay, and which I mentioned again and again a lot. This is the uh, key stake for the uh, oil companies. Remember, uh, I said before that uh, when you have uh, the local, uh, this oil field in this case, the production capacity, you know, basically designed for let's say uh, how many barrels uh, per day and multiply by the uh, number of days at uh, the uh, oil, you know, crude oil market of the day. You could easily look at a million dollar a day. Okay, with all this bottleneck and, and you know, growing into the snowball, which becomes domino, you know, effect, blah, blah, blah. You, you get the whole picture, right? So we're looking at tens of millions of dollars easily lost, if not hundred million dollars, right? So now let me ask you this question. Do you think the oil company people, I'm talking about the senior management, okay? It, is it wise for them to make the decision not to allocate the budget for this kind of thing uh, to solve the problem? I don't know. I mean, I'll leave that for you, you know, for a judgmental call, right? They may have their problem that I don't know. I'm not aware of. I am I mean, after all, I'm not looking at the picture. They are, right? So back to the point about the, um, operation research. Operation research uh, is something uh, emerged uh, during the last great war when, uh, you know, SMR was a rising star because he was the guy prove to the whole world you want to fight a war you gotta have the most advanced logistic uh, military logistic support to win the war which is you know basically nothing new for the chinese and it was more than 1000 years ago the chinese have a saying before you after sending your troops making sure you mobilize you know you uh, gather enough feeds for your horses and food for your soldiers and mobilize those things first before you you know start marching your soldiers uh, to the battlefield common sense for chinese uh more than a thousand years ago um so anyway uh operating research uh was a very effective uh way to um basically help to make the operational uh decision or operation management decision because, uh, hey, you have certain, uh, I guess, divisions of trained soldiers and uh, each one of them has certain uh, characteristics and you send them into battlefield and those are resources and you, you have the predefined military objective and how do you fulfill that because everything happens uh, in, in different scenarios and uh, you are going to optimize. Uh, you don't have unlimited resources. Oh, I just lost uh, two thirds of a division. Let me just uh, bring you another one. Where, from From where? Do you actually have all that in your back pocket? Uh, typically, strategically, you do have the reserve, but you don't use up your reserve easily uh, at the beginning of a battle, right? Uh, you wanna win a war, you gotta have reserve. Uh, you use them uh, at the best timing. So there's always a resource uh, planning and how to use it to win the war. So anyway, that was the military uh, logistic and the military operation research. And of course, 
today we don't call everything like warehousing, transportation, we call them logistic, but that's the military word, you know, we borrowed from the military. And the operational research basically the same thing, except for uh, it makes a whole lot of sense in, in, in uh, to the generals in the military uh, logistics. It does not make as much sense to the uh, corporate executives who are um, undereducated, let's say, uh, over this. Uh, they may have their fancy degree, right? But pff, it's, they don't have this. And of course, the academic fellows, uh, they like to brag about how fancy their uh, algorithms are are how impressive but hey guess what you, you can't impress me because i don't understand the thing about the algorithm all i understand as a business person hey you gotta come in here solve my problem i don't care how fancy your algorithm is if you don't solve my problem you're no worthy of anything to me right so there you get the uh, picture people on both sides they don't understand each other. They don't even make it, you know, even enough attempt to communicate. And that's why operational research failed in the uh, business logistic comparing to the uh, operational research for the military logistics. So let's talk a little bit about operational research. So basically um, where they're supposed to work and they fail is they need to first learn the problems, okay, the real business problem. And uh, then they have to uh, develop the objectives. And the objectives, there are three levels, strategic level objectives, operation level objectives, and tactic level objectives. So when their objectives are defined wrong, and you need to remember this, you don't, of course you don't uh, learn enough about the operation research yet, but you probably don't have to if you are, this is not going to be like a, becoming your, your future profession. But if you're just a logistician or supply chain management uh, related professional, what you do need to know is um, this objective has to be set really, really as close enough as to solving the real problems. Because if you got all this wrong, the output of this process becomes so irrelevant and which happens all the time, more often than not to, okay? And that's where the academic people fail to communicate with the business people, uh, their clients. Uh, and then uh, once you have these uh, objectives basically set up, um, you also, the well, your, well, what is object? Objective is to solve your problem, right? Let's say we have the consensus established between the academic people or the OR specialists uh, internally with us, the business uh, or the internal stakeholders. We agree this is the problem. So you need to develop what? Solution, right? And this is a quantitative solution. So before the quantitative solution, the key, I'm gonna repeat again, the key is to conduct the qualitative analysis by the business people first. You gotta understand. Okay, the, if you don't understand, you just go, oh, hey, uh, this is the problem, uh, come solve for me. That's not going to work because the academic people, they don't really understand. They think they do, but they don't. Okay. If they don't understand the problem, how do they offer the solution? A lot of times they just come in with solution, try to match the solution with their problem. That's where it fails. So anyway, we talked about the problem, we talked solution, and then there is going to be a solve. That's a mathematics solve, right? That's what the operation research, basically the model analysis do to solve. Okay, so when you have so many problems identified and you want to have this objective basically to, you know, towards the solution, you need to identify the constraints. What's the constraints? Oh, it's basically the things that just basically, <laughs> there's nothing you can do about, you know, as far as to uh, come up with, you know, with the solution, uh, because it, it's, it's gonna stay there. For instance, like, uh, um, 
in a scenario, the casing point I just uh, cited earlier, um, there's there's some constraint, right? So when you when you um, go into the central side, you design uh, or designate the uh, 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 the uh, staging space. You do, you do remember that I mentioned before. Typically, it's multiple EPC, you know, awarded uh, contract for different kind of tasks, but each one of them may just you know subcontract to a different three PL. So you will have like a multiple three PLs working. Uh, in their own little silos, and um, basically each one is designated with a certain, uh, you know, uh, staging space. But over the time, nobody's really watching uh, all the time. They get mixed up, mixed up by the uh, delivery trucks. They drop probably in the wrong zone, and then they get disappeared. Um, how do you solve this problem? You got to have a 4 PO I mentioned before sitting on you know, top of this uh, chain of command, but hey, there's no 4PL available in oil industry. That's a constraint. So you don't have the part working parties communicating, you know, collaborating between each other. That's the chaos. You think the OR can do anything about that? No. So that's one constraint there for you. And there are many, many, okay? So when you have too many constraints, um, that basically reduces the possibility mathematically for you to get a better result. So the result, the ultimate result you're uh, working towards mathematically is called, you know, solve. So when you have so many uh, different uh, problems and uh, constraints, what they call dimension becomes more and more complicated. So at this point, your solve becomes less and less effective as you would anticipate. Um, so now it is, you know, there are two things you can do. One is to resolve the so-called dimensions. And and so because it's multiple, it's always like a multiple, you know, problem. Can you dissect them, you know, from multiple to single problems? That's one way. And people commonly do that all the time. So that's one way you pursue. And if your input, if you can educate the academic people or the uh, internal OR specialist, they will be able to do this because they're trained for this. But if they're not educated on the real problem and how to dissect them, you know, uh, actually the way the business people would consent, then you end up with the wrong output. Okay, and when they walk away, you shake your hand, I mean, your head, and like, I just wasted my time. I'm, I talked about a one approach. The other approach is basically compromise. If you rec recognize the fact that not everything will, you will come up to the perfect salute, or I mean, the solve, um, you will have to um, basically learn to accept what is second best next to the ideal. I mean, we're not living in a, uh, ideal world, right? So the compromise is to set between uh, what is accept or acceptable uh, solve, uh, mathematically, I guess, optimized uh, by the academic people or your internal OR specialist. And if you do that, you will have a solve. And if you don't want to compromise anywhere, you will not have a solve, okay? So one more thing to add um, before we uh, wrap up in the hour is the solver. The solver is basically a uh, pretty generically developed, uh, uh, I guess, vehicle uh, towards most common problems. But my personal belief is that uh, at least in the upstream logistics, not the midstream, now downstream, it's very difficult to find the uh, generic uh, uh, solve because all the problems are different. So when each problem, okay, in pattern, kind of uh, in disagreement with another problem in pattern, and you got a lot of them in different patterns again, 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 and you try to use that solver, <laughs> chances are you're going to fail. Uh, and 
it might even take more time for the folks uh, on the academic side to actually work toward the solve with the solver because solver becomes so <laughs> incumbent, right? So, uh, oh, I mean, uh, uh, cumbersome for the incumbent. Uh, so um, that's that's the thing. You need to remember this. One model is good for one real problem situation. And you try to use the same model for everything and anything. That's where you're going to be dead wrong. Okay. So once again, you need to understand the problem and try to be able to educate the folks coming here with the mathematics solutions to be worked up, not the ready to use solution because it's not going to work, right? Unless you don't work in the upstream uh, sector for the logistics, maybe in those cases, yeah, you got a repeated pattern uh, all the time, all you know, everywhere. That's a different story. But for upstream, I'm sorry, you got to have the customized solution every time uh, for the type of scenario. But once you have the model for the same scenario, uh, then chances are you might be able to reuse the same model. Okay. But you cannot universally use it everywhere. Uh, there always has to be some kind of uh, adjustment there, here and there. So anyway, that wrap up this uh, class video as the last one. Uh, after this, no more class video. Um, a little advertisement here. Uh, beyond this semester, uh, you guys already know that I'm not teaching anymore, uh, but not for the uh, credit not for GPA, uh, I'm going to start sharing some, uh, I think, uh, helpful uh, life philosophy, uh, also on YouTube, uh, but under different uh, account. If you're interested, uh, you're will welcome to uh, tune in. Um, basically, I will be talking about uh, the Taoist uh, way of thinking and somehow comparing to uh, the uh, Confucianism and Zen. Uh, so where are they different? Uh, how they impact on our daily life? Uh, basically, uh, work-life uh, balance and your career, uh, you know, goal setting, adjustment. So basically, it sounds like, oh, very complicated um, philosophy, but no. It's down to earth, very practical. And also, it is for us, every one of us, to try to figure it out every day in our daily life routine. Uh, so, try to make some sense out of uh, whatever philosophy works for you. And in this case, I'm sharing the, you know, mine over Taoism. And maybe that will be interesting to you, maybe not. And you want to give it a shot and, you know, try and see if it's going to make any sense for you. If not, of course, you drop out. Uh, I'm not going to score you this time or great, right? So stay safe and hopefully I'll see you uh, over the other channel under a different account. Uh, so bye now.